evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to what we have figured is the 8th Annual Boggs Lecture. And uh, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors of Animal Ecology, Animal Science, Agronomy Departments, the Biology Program, uh, Botany Department, Environmental Studies Program, uh, Plant Pathology and Zoology. I think we have a record of co-sponsors this time. Uh, of course, we have the Graduate College and the Committee on Lectures helping us out with this. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Samuel McNaughton. He got uh, his BS at Northwest Missouri State College. Uh, earned his PhD in botany at uh, University of Texas with Calvin McMillan. Uh, postdoctoral work at Stanford University at Stanford University with Peter Raven, and has been with the botany faculty or the biology faculty uh, at Syracuse since 1966. Uh, he has worked extensively with the ecology of typha uh, until 1973 and has been wor uh, working with grazing ecology in the Serengeti ecosystem since then. Um, he's published extensively on all his work, including very many journal articles and a textbook of plant ecology. Uh, his topic tonight is ecology and management of tropical savanna grasslands. Uh, I'd also like to make a commercial for the Botany Department Lecture at uh, Agronomy Lecture Hall 2050 tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock rather than a regular time of 4.10. Um, and we're going to try to start right at 4 o'clock tomorrow. So uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. McNaughton. Thank you, Ned. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's a particular pleasure to be invited by the uh, uh, student organization and have the opportunity. Whoops. Here we go. Me and microphones. <laughs> this is a problem. Now, we're plugged in. We're ready to go. It's a pleasure to uh, be here at the uh, invitation of the graduate students, have the opportunity to talk to them about their research. And uh, tonight I'm going to talk about uh, uh, some of the problems uh, that are involved in uh, managing uh, African game parks, and uh, particularly about my own research. And what I think, although it's academic research, are the applications of that research to uh, management problems. Uh, those problems, uh, some of them are, uh, have nothing to do with research, like trying to maintain roads uh, and uh, having enough money to uh, maintain the infrastructure. Uh, others are more serious, like uh, trying to control poaching, which my research has nothing whatsoever to do with, uh, but which we all know the solutions for, uh, but nobody has the money to accomplish that. Uh, but what I'm going to try to do is to talk to you about what I've been doing in terms of research for the last 15 years. I've been working uh, in the Serengeti for 15 years, and so I'm going to try to summarize that research uh, in the context of what research can contribute to understanding how natural ecosystems operate. And the fundamental supposition that uh, underlies this is that proper management uh, uh, policies uh, it must be based on sound scientific knowledge. So let's, uh, with that uh, introduction, let's start uh, with the uh, first slide and uh, get under what? <coughs> I always like to start with the big picture. <laughs> I took this uh, one uh, <laughs> afternoon uh, when I had nothing else to do. Uh, you'll recognize Saudi Arabia. Uh, here I hope. Is that in focus? Uh, it looks a little out of focus to me. Let me see if I can buzz it in a little bit. Oh, well done. Uh, and uh, here's Africa, a uh, huge uh, land mass, and of course uh, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, contains uh, Earth's most diverse and uh, until recent times, well, still most abundant populations of uh, large game mammals. Uh, here's the Horn of Somalia, Lake Victoria is about here, and the area that we're going to talk about uh, lies uh, just east of Lake Victoria. This was an area that was first discovered by Caucasians in 1899 when a German explorer uh, crossed, uh, crossed the, uh, from uh, 
the uh, coast to the southern part of uh, Lake Victoria. It uh, was established as a game reserve in the 1920s and became generally accessible uh, around 1950 when uh, various uh, crossings uh, of the uh, rivers were established and roads uh, were put into the area. So it's a relatively recently accessible area. Uh, it was made famous in this country in the 1920s by a, a couple of uh, wildlife photographers uh, from Kansas uh, who were probably the most famous wildlife movie makers of that time, Martin and Osa Johnson, were the first person to drive an automobile into the area in the 1920s. You might know that Americans would be the first person uh, to introduce air pollution into the uh, Serengeti uh, ecosystem. Now, we're going backwards here, but now we're underway. And uh, the, uh, let's uh, zoom that back, yeah, okay. The uh, region lies just south of the equator from one to three degrees south. So there's no uh, temperature seasonality to speak of at all. It's at an elevation of uh, nominal mean elevation of 1,500 meters. Uh, it slopes up slightly from Lake Victoria to the west uh, to fairly substantially to the Crater Highlands, which is a volcanic area. Uh, to the southeast of the, uh, the park. And uh, daytime highs uh, would be, uh, well, let's talk Fahrenheit, would be in the 80s, and uh, nighttime lows would usually be in the sort of mid to upper 50s, and it's that way every day, day after day, uh, year around. There is, however, pronounced seasonality uh, that's associated with the intertropical convergence zone, uh, which is a uh, pressure system that's associated uh, with the equatorial uh, latitudes. And uh, this moves south of the park and then <coughs> moves back north of the park, creating a, a wet and dry season. Uh, the wet season is roughly our winter, and uh, the dry season is roughly our summer. This is particularly advantageous to me because it gives me an excuse to get out of Syracuse in the wintertime and to go to uh, the uh, Serengeti. The wet season is uh, sort of November to May, peaking just about now in April. And uh, then the dry season is uh, June through October. And the driest month is June, uh, statistically. That is, when the rains stop, they stop with a bang and it gets uh, dry everywhere. In addition to that, uh, Lake Victoria <coughs> has its own rainfall pattern. There's this huge exposed water surface out here which creates its own rainfall zone uh, in the park. And the high altitudes of the uh, crater uh, highlands uh, also create a rain shadow effect. The two principal areas that I've worked in are Serengeti National Park in Tanzania and uh, Masai Mara Game Reserve in Kenya, although for the last 10 years I've worked only in Serengeti National Park because they uh, facilitate uh, research quite well and there have been various border and political problems involving the two countries. <coughs> this is the uh, southwest or southeastern uh, Serengeti uh, during the peak of the wet season and uh, this gives you a, a good feeling uh, for what the area is like. These animals are wildebeest, these animals are Thompson's gazelle and uh, the vegetation is a short grassland, what we call a grazing lawn. That grazing lawn is maintained by the animals uh, you can see their hooves in some of these pictures. All of those black dots are wildebeest, and if you can imagine uh, standing on your land road and looking in all directions and seeing the same scene and then driving to the next hill, next hill, next hill, looking over this for mile after mile, you've got some feeling for the number of game animals that are present in this area. Uh, it's a huge uh, 
herd. This is the, the largest herd of free-ranging ungulates uh, in the world. And uh, this area of short grassland is maintained through the activities of these animals. This is on volcanic soils that are derived from the uh, crater islands. They're highly fertile, uh, which I'll talk a bit about uh, tomorrow afternoon. And uh, this is a specific landscape region that we refer to as the Southwestern Plains. Uh, it's typical rolling plains like this. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, animals concentrate there uh, during the wet season. This is also their calving ground. Uh, the wildebeest are synchronous calves. And uh, <coughs> the uh, calves, about 80% of them are all dropped. Uh, in about a 10 day period. Uh, so it's like a huge obstetrics ward out there in a sense with all of these wildebeest calves appearing. In addition to that, the calves, most of them, are dropped between about 1 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So it's a spectacular uh, event when the calving season uh, is going on. Uh, this is another typical habitat that these uh, animals occupy. Uh, what you've just seen is the wet season habitat. Uh, this would be a more characteristic dry season habitat. Uh, it's what we think of more often, I think, as an African landscape, a uh, savanna landscape, with these sort of open grasslands with an overstory of acacia. You can see the grass is fairly brown and dry. And you can see also that it's uh, taller grass. Uh, these animals are into grass that now is about belly high uh, rather than hoof high. <coughs> the wildebeest are the animals that dominate the system. They're the most abundant animals in the system. They range over the system and they define the system. And they move on an annual cycle that's related to the rainfall and seasonal gradient across the uh, ecosystem. The uh, grasslands uh, are quite uh, varied. Uh, this shows uh, uh, data based on ordination, uh, which is a technique of ordering the vegetation based on the species composition. This shows two ordination axes. Uh, there's a short grass continuum of uh, short grasses that occur mainly in the south and uh, the eastern parts of the uh, Serengeti National Park. There's a mid to tall grass continuum. And these are arranged from 1 to 17, sort of uh, arbitrarily by the height of the area, or the height of the vegetation, with an outlier in these floodplain uh, grasslands, <coughs> which reach a height of roughly 2 to 2.5 meters during the wet season, are basically ungrazed during that season, but then can be heavily grazed at the peak of the dry season during which they represent an important uh, food reservoir. The first ordination axis is most closely related uh, to grazing intensity. And uh, <coughs> could you just screw that up just a notch maybe on the, yeah, there we go. This shows the uh, position on ordination axis one plotted against uh, mean annual grazing int uh, intensity. And you can see that this axis uh, is primarily reflecting uh, grazing intensity. Grazing intensity is one thing you're going to hear quite a bit about tonight uh, and quantified in various ways, so I should explain what this index represents. <coughs> this is an index that uh, ranges from 0 to 1, and it's the difference, <coughs> it's 1 minus the standing crop of uh, vegetation in grazed plots over the standing crop of vegetation in ungrazed plots, where ungrazed plots are fenced plots. So if the vegetation is grazed totally, uh, this index would be 1, and uh, if it was grazed uh, not, not at all, uh, it would be close to 0. On an annual basis, uh, grazing intensity ranges from about 0.7 in some of the short grasslands uh, down to relatively low in some of these uh, tall grasslands. 
<coughs> these grasslands also are geographically arranged. That is, the short grasslands occur mainly in the southeast, and tall grasslands up in the northwestern part of the system. <coughs> if we take all uh, sites over all seasons uh, and look at this same index, there are a few uh, uh, areas where grazing intensity over the short term can be extremely heavy with basically all of the standing crop consumed, but uh, many of the plots uh, would be ungrazed for significant periods. So fundamentally, the grazing systems are of two types uh, in this ecosystem. There's what's a sustained yield system, which occurs mainly uh, during the wet season. <coughs> These are grasslands that the grazers concentrate on when the rains start, they uh, stay on those uh, stands as long as the rains continue so that over the, the annual cycle, the grazing intensity is extremely high. There are also rotational grazing systems. These are systems that are rested for long periods of time, that is, they have a grazing intensity of zero or quite close to it, uh, because the large nomadic herbivores are absent. Uh, but then uh, during the dry season, these stands can be grazed extremely heavily. <coughs> There's a pronounced rainfall gradient across the system. And uh, this shows rainfall uh, in centimeters per year. And that rain, this is the first thing that attracted me to the system was this rainfall gradient because there's a rainfall gradient that ra <coughs> ranges from about the high plains of Wyoming or Colorado, the prairie forest border in Ohio or Illinois. That is from about 40 centimeters per year to about uh, well over 100 cent centimeters per year, up to about 1,200. And this is created by uh, the effect of Lake Victoria and the rain shadow that's created by the highlands to the southeast. The animals move in relation to this rainfall gradient, and when I say the animals, I'm particularly talking about the wildebeest uh, here. <coughs> I warned Ned that my voice tends to fade in the evening, so you're just going to have to put up with me uh, taking drinks of water from time to time to keep it going. In the wet season, the nomadic herds concentrate in the driest part of the system down in the southeast. These are the short grasslands. They concentrate down here. This is the, the uh, calving ground. They move out to the west toward Lake Victoria in seasonal transitions. And at the peak of the dry season, they end up in the wettest part of the system up in the north and west, where they're feeding principally on these tall grasslands. Uh, so they're moving from short grasslands through mid grasslands, ultimately ending up in tall grasslands. At the peak of the dry season, uh, <coughs> sort of late period of the dry season, which would be sort of August, September. So if you're interested in going to the Serengeti and seeing the animals, you want to go to different places and different times. If you want to see the animals during what's our summer, you'd go to Kenya, uh, where they're concentrated. If you want to see it in our winter, you'd go to the Serengeti National Park and see it down in the southeast. <clears throat> now, this is related to the pattern of rainfall uh, in the system. And this shows uh, annual rainfall averaged across a series of sites, which represent short grass sites, mid grass sites, and tall grass sites. And in the short grass sites, which generally have a rainfall of below 600 millimeters annually, less than a quarter of the rainfall, and generally in many cases less than 10%, falls in the dry season. So they have a very distinct dry season. As you go up the, rain, uh, the rainfall gradient, uh, the, rain, the, the wet and dry season are much less distinct until you get up to the high rainfall areas in the northwest. Basically, there isn't, we talk about a wet and a dry season, fundamentally there isn't. That is about 40% of the rainfall falls in the dry season, about 60% in the wet season. As a consequence of that, there's a, a growing season gradient 
across this ecosystem uh, that's comparable to the growing season gradient that's sort of going from North Dakota to Texas in terms of temperature. And the growing season down here <coughs> is about 70 or 80 days, comparable to a frost-free period in the northern Great Plains. But as you go up this gradient, uh, you're up to a uh, growing season of 300 to 340 days. That is, it's almost like being uh, in the, uh, the tropics. So the point of this is that although the, there's no temperature seasonality, uh, there's no frost or anything like that, there's a pronounced growing season gradient across this system. And the animals that are most abundant, that is the nomadic or migratory herbivores, move in relation to they concentrate down here during the wet season, and as the dry season progresses, they move right up this gradient to the, uh, the tall grasslands up in the northwest. Tomorrow, I'm going to talk about some of the nutritional patterns that are related to that rainfall gradient, which may provide more insight into why it's adaptive to do that. Now, let's talk about the animals uh, in a little more detail. This is the, this is the animal which is the fundamental uh, animal that gives this ecosystem its character. It's the most abundant herd of free-ranging ungulates in the world. It's the wildebeest or white-bearded gnu, uh, <coughs> for obvious reasons. Uh, there are 1.4 million uh, of these wildebeest in the system. At the time that the animals first started to be counted by aerial surveys, uh, in the 1950s, there were about a quarter of a million of them. These animals are subject to an exotic uh, disease called viral disease, called cattle plague or rinderpest. Uh, they don't act as carriers. They either die uh, or they develop antibodies to the disease, and they typically die shortly after weaning. In 1964, this area was declared a rinderpest-free zone. All the cattle outside the park were inoculated with rinderpest, uh, or with rinderpest vaccine. And this population began to increase. And it increased from about 300,000 up to about 1.4 million, where it's been stable uh, for about the last uh, six or eight years. <coughs> This animal moves over the entire area. It represents about 70%, 65 to 70% of the total large mammal biomass in the system. <coughs> Another animal that moves over a comparable area is the uh, plain zebra, the Equus brichellii. Uh, there are only 250,000 of these but they move over an area that's comparable to the wildebeest. They're also nomadic. They move with each other in some sort of very complicated fashion. Whenever you see wildebeest, you'll always see a few zebra. When you see a lot of zebra, you'll always see a few wildebeest uh, scattered uh, within this. Uh, they're not sensitive to uh, render pests. They're an equid. And their numbers have basically remain the same at about 250 or 300,000 uh, individuals. Uh, since censuses began. <clears throat> Another important uh, animal is the Thompson's gazelle. These are much smaller animals, standing about this tall at the shoulder. There are uh, two different types of these in terms of their behavior. In numbers, there are about 650,000 of them uh, in the system, although that's widely debated. Uh, the first census of these uh, said there were 650,000 plus or minus a confidence interval of 600,000. Uh, so uh, there's uh, quite a bit of debate about the actual numbers. The current thinking is, however, that these animals have been declining over about the last decade until uh, they're now down to uh, perhaps uh, 250 or 300,000. Reasons for this are not obvious. In fact, they're, they're totally unknown. Some people feel it may be due to competition with the wildebeest. Other people feel that there are diseases that are plaguing the populations. Nobody really knows. And I'm uh, very uncertain about what the actual numbers of these animals are. <clears throat> There's a migratory herd, which is the bulk of the animals uh, that moves 
onto and off of the open plains in the southeast during the wet season, dry season. But there are also resident herds. These are animals that occupy a home range. They're scattered throughout the system. Wherever you find a little patch of open grassland in the savannas, there will always be some Thompson's gazelle. <coughs> the other major uh, abundant herbivore is the African buffalo. These are big animals, uh, known to wreak havoc on land rovers as well as human beings. <laughs> Uh, they're the most dangerous animal in the park. Uh, they've killed more people than all other animals combined. The only more dangerous thing in the park is automobile accidents. Uh, these animals uh, do not occur on the, the open Serengeti Plains in the southeast. They occur only in the savanna regions. They're non-migratory. They occupy home ranges. They occur as uh, resident herds of cows and calves. Uh, with associated breeding bulls. Uh, there are also lots of old, uh, scarred, battered, presumably uh, successful but now retired uh, bachelor bulls scattered throughout the uh, park. Uh, there are about 60,000 of these. Uh, these animals have been subject to heavy poaching over the last three or four years, and uh, there are certain areas of the park that uh, they've been knocked out of pretty completely uh, by poaching with snare lines, which is devastating uh, to these uh, animals. One likes to think that the poachers paid a price and uh, dead and maimed and injured, but that's probably not the case. Now, <clears throat> one final uh, sort of uh, comment on the general ecology of the system. I first got to the Serengeti in 1973. I went back for research. 1974. And the problem that everybody was talking about at that time was the elephant problem. This was regarded as a serious problem in the management of African <coughs> game parks. The elephant problem wasn't an elephant problem, it was what elephants did. And what elephants did was they killed trees. It's known that elephants were present in the Serengeti in the late 19th century from the Arab ivory trade because they were taking tusks out of this area. But from the time that the game reserve and then national park was established in the 1920s, elephants were unknown in this area until 1952 when they first appeared. <clears throat> they appeared because they were crowded in uh, to the park from areas surrounding the park where human habitation uh, was increasing. Uh, by the time I arrived, uh, there were 3,000 elephants in the park. That is, it went from zero uh, in 1952 to 3,000 in 1974. Consequence of that, now if you can imagine each one of these tree carcasses standing upright with a canopy on it, <clears throat> you can imagine that this was a much more closed woodland before elephants arrived. In fact, there are good aerial photo photo photography I dedicate that that's the case. But after the elephants arrived, the woodlands were opened up, and they were opened up to the savannah. So the elephant problem when I arrived was elephants kill trees. We've got to do something about that. That all changed in 1979, and that's when the elephant trade hit this park. And since that time, 85% uh, of the elephant population has been eliminated. There are now 300 elephants left in the park. And there's no tusk that's longer than about a foot long. This is a management problem about which research has very little to say. <clears throat> and it's going to change the entire character of the park uh, over the next couple of generations. Now, back to uh, research and some of the patterns uh, in the grasslands and what they reveal about the uh, way the, uh, the system functions. One of the things I was interested in was the relationship between rainfall and primary productivity. Fifteen years later, it seems like a relatively straightforward question, but at that time, no single study had looked at primary productivity over a range of rainfall uh, as extensive as this, using exactly the same methods done by exactly the same people. Uh, this shows uh, above ground net primary productivity in grams per square meter per year. 
you notice that this symbol is uh, CPN. It means control net productivity. It means net productivity in fences that are protected from the animals. So the animals are having no impact. And this would be the productivity uh, of these grasslands in the absence of the animals. There's nothing really uh, very interesting about this. Uh, productivity increases from about 100 grams per square meter per year up to about 600 grams per square meter per year. It's essentially the same as the, the relationships that uh, other people have established uh, through colony uh, studies from the literature. But what was interesting to us at the time when we first developed these data and what we're uh, more and more interested in now is certain locations at high rainfall areas that had quite low uh, net productivity. So that is, the thing that became more interesting to us as time went by uh, was not the trend line, but the outliers from that trend line, even either high outliers or low outliers. And my talk tomorrow afternoon will deal a little bit with what may be responsible for this. Now, in addition to this, we had a series of movable explosions that were designed to estimate net productivity uh, in the presence of the animals. Of course, this is impossible to do, uh, so we approximated this with a system of movable exclosures that we would move over short time periods in the presence of the animals, that is, intervening for short time periods and measuring the positive biomass increments of those exclosures to gain insight uh, into how the animals we're influencing net primary productivity of the grasslands. Now, further, these exclosures were not moved on any set interval. That is, we didn't say we're going to move exclosures every 60 days or every 30 days. We moved them, and some of the, these so called temporary exclosures might sit there for several months if there was no animal impact in the area. But then, when the animals came into the area and grazed the vegetation down, they might be moved to two-week intervals, and in some cases, as short as a week to 10-day intervals, looking at uh, the uh, impact of the animals on the uh, grasslands. Now, I must confess that when I started this uh, project, my general view was it would rain so much, <clears throat> the grass would grow so much, and the animals would eat so much. And from this, you could estimate carrying capacity of the system. When I first met with the chief park warden, uh, who's now director of Tanzania National Parks, he said to me, I think the most important thing that you could do to us, uh, for us, is to estimate carrying capacity of this system for these large ungulates. And I said, fine, David, I'll get back to you next year with the number. Well, <clears throat> that was 15 years ago, and uh, the number is not there yet. But I think we're getting closer, and I hope you'll agree. Uh, as we conclude, uh, you see. So we measured control net productivity. This is exactly the same data that you've just seen. And this is actual net productivity, which is productivity in these temporary explosions. This is the equality line. <clears throat> and as you can see, most of the points lie above the equality line. Once again, short grasslands, mid grasslands, tall grasslands. And some of them lie substantially of the equality line. So <clears throat> these large ungulates, through their grazing activity, in fact, are stimulating the above ground productivity of these grasslands, uh, in some cases uh, by substantial uh, increments. So that became the puzzle. Now we're about two years, two and a half years into the project by this stage. <clears throat> And on a growing season basis, ungrazed vegetation averaged about two grams per square meter per day during the growing season. Uh, grazing had two effects. First, it changed the mean, just about doubling it from about two grams per square meter per day up to about, which is a fairly prosaic level for the grasslands, up to about four, level, four grams per square meter per day, which is a pretty interesting figure. But in addition, it increased the variance substantially. And in some cases, uh, the growing season productivity of these grasslands were above 6 and up to 10 or 11 grams per square meter per day, 
which is equivalent to the sort of productivity one might suspect or expect from an industrial, su industrially subsidized agricultural grassland. And yet these are systems that are running only on the energy of the sun. So that became the fundamental problem. Now if we go back to grazing intensity and look at this the difference between these two, that is the stimulation of productivity in relation to grazing uh, uh, intensity, there's some range between 0.4 and 0.6 on a mean annual basis that seems to optimize uh, the level of net primary productivity. Now one thing that's obvious is that grazers cannot turn a desert into an oasis. That is, they can't go out in a fundamentally unproductive uh, uh, environment and turn that environment into a more productive one. So this is not uncoupled from and independent of the physical environment. And this bottom panel shows soil moisture potential uh, in uh, <coughs> megapascals, where this is very dry soil, this is quite moist soil. And this shows stimulation over a short time periods expressed as grams per square meter per day. The thing this indicates is stimulation tends to be higher uh, on moist soils uh, than it is on dry soils. Although in a couple of minutes I'll show you some lab results uh, that uh, tend to contradict this or provide an alternative uh, type of view of this. And in fact, the grazer's behavior, of course, is cued so that they tend to concentrate down here. Uh, that is, they're tending to operate in systems where the soil moisture potential uh, is uh, sufficient uh, to provide this uh, stimulatory response. Now, one of the things that I don't want to leave with you, however, is that this is necessarily any direct effect of soil moisture potential on plant growth. There are many other things that are operating here, such as soil processes and mineralization and uh, so on, that may be uh, involved in creating this curve. And in fact, this shows an experiment that was done by a colleague of mine that were concurrent uh, with my early studies, like Peter Maniqua, who's a faculty member at the University of Dar es Salaam. He fenced a variety of plots uh, out on the short grasslands uh, in the southeast and uh, he had a series of control plots and others to which he added done. Early in the growing season, when there would be a big burst of mineralization in these uh, savanna soils, there was no effect of done. It was only later in the wet season, as the biomass of plant material accumulated, uh, that, and minerals and uh, nutrients can be tied up in that uh, biomass, that dung had any effect, and ultimately resulting in peak biomasses of fenced plots, and we're a good 60% above those of unfenced plots. So, the Nequa's experiment suggested to us uh, that nutrient cycling is one of the important factors uh, that operates in uh, this uh, ecosystem. Now, at this stage, <coughs> we're going to go to the lab for a, a brief period. This project involves three basic types of, of science. It involves field science of the sort that you've just seen. It involves laboratory experiments of the type you're going to see. And it also involves extensive uh, computer simulation models uh, that are designed to couple these and uh, to gain insight into things that is impossible to control in either the field or the laboratory. This shows a typical uh, drought experiment. Uh, with control plants uh, that are well watered, uh, some clipped, some unclipped, and a series of plants that have been taken into dormancy uh, through uh, drought, uh, some clipped and some unclipped. We typically do this sort of multifactorial experiment, trying to gain insight now into three principal factors. Uh, water as a regulator of uh, plant productivity, defoliation as a regulator of productivity, and nutrient <coughs> supply as a regulator of productivity. Now one of the things we discovered early on is that uh, the response of these plants to defoliation, uh, this now represents the amount clip, clipped off, in other words, what we call yield to grazers, <coughs> was associated with two principal growth responses of the grasses. Uh, one was 
tillering, that is the number of active meristems, or what's referred to as tillering in grasses, uh, based on different nitrogen supplies, low nitrogen supply, high nitrogen supply, <coughs> so that the amount of their ability to sustain clipping is heavily dependent upon this tillering response, and that tillering response is heavily dependent upon nutritional status, in this case, uh, nitrogen supply. Second factor, you can't see this, but this is leaf elongation rate in centimeters per day. Uh, it was also important, once again, with high nitrogen plants having much greater leaf elongation rates and much better able to compensate for herbivory than the filled circles, which represent the low nitrogen plants. So one of the things that immediately popped out of the laboratory work was the ability of plants to respond to defoliation by comp compensatory mechanisms was heavily dependent upon nutrient status. Plants under poor nutritional status were incapable of responding in any compensatory fashion, whereas those under higher nutrient uh, status uh, were perfectly capable. This shows a similar response. Uh, this, the previous one was a short grass. Uh, this is a mid grass, just to show you that high nitrogen, low nitrogen, basically uh, the same response. That is, tillering and leaf elongation rate is an important component of the ability of these plants to respond to defoliation in a way that tends to compensate for the negative effects of that, and this is strongly nutrient dependent. So the lab work began to point more and more <coughs> toward nutrients as an important factor, although soil moisture could also be important. This shows the drought experiment that you saw the plants from just a few minutes ago. This shows the drying out of the soil as the plants uh, go into a drought cycle and water is withheld. <coughs> And the unclipped plants deplete the moisture much more rapidly uh, than the clipped plants, as you might expect, because the transpiration surface is quite low. A consequence of this, however, is uh, many of the unclipped plants, are in, they dry out the soil so rapidly that they're incapable of going into dormancy. That is, that the drought cycle actually kills them, whereas the clipped plants have a much more gradual period of going uh, drying out the soil. So they're able to store reserves in the, the leaf bases and the roots. These plants are much more likely to go into dormancy. These plants are much more likely to die. <coughs> well, I'm not going, this gets uh, a little more technical than I'd like to. Now, we're going to go uh, from the uh, sort of uh, scientific uh, to the sublime, if not the ridiculous. Uh, it's been suggested uh, by various people that components uh, in saliva could stimulate plant growth. And a good friend of mine, uh, Mel Dyer, suggested uh, that this was an important uh, component of the responses of plants to defoliation. I didn't believe it for a minute. If <coughs> at all. But I decided to do an experiment with a component of saliva, thiamine. Of course, you know that plants make thiamine in the roots and tends to translocate it uh, to the tops. You also know uh, that ungulates don't make thiamine, although their rumen microbes can. And in fact, thiamine is an important component of ungulate saliva. So I added thiamine at parts per billion concentrations 2 point, or 0.2 mils, in other words, growth factor concentrations uh, were added to plants. And in fact, twirl, it was a two to the fifth involving nitrogen, phosphorus, thiamine, and clipping, and species. I'm going to show you just one result of this experiment. <coughs> and uh, this is an experiment with short grass, and this shows uh, no clipped and clipped plants, uh, minus thiamine, plus thiamine. On the clipped plants, there was no effect of thiamine, <coughs> zero. But on the unclipped plants, thiamine of these presumably, you know, well supplied to plants, uh, plenty of nutrients and so on, was increased 49%. A reasonable conclusion from this experiment is that the smart ungulate should go around and slobber on the plants <laughs> and then come back at some future time to feed them. 
<laughs> Obviously, this is not what's going on in nature. But much to my surprise, the salivary component had a tremendous <laughs> compensatory effect on plants. Now, in addition to things like prosaic things like pion, ungulate saliva is a source <clears throat> of a variety of growth factors that have proved important uh, in tissue culture, including uh, epidermal growth factor, which is first isolated from submaxillary glands of rats by Cohen. And <clears throat> Mel Dyer, who laughed heartily when I got the thiamine uh, results, suggested that we do an epidermal growth factor experiment, which he had shown uh, was active in the, uh, the sorghum uh, seedling elongation uh, test for growth factor activity. So I thought that was a splendid idea. Uh, we costed out an experiment. Uh, I don't know how much biological materials cost, but this must be one of the most expensive uh, materials available. It costs about $1.2 million a gram for this. Uh, so I estimated that, you know, my budget for about five.